section twenty nine of curiosities of literature volume three this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org curiosities of literature volume three by isaac disraeli quadrio's account of english poetry it is perhaps somewhat mortifying in our literary researches to discover that our own literature has been only known to other nations of europe comparatively within recent times we have at length triumphed over our continental rivals in the noble struggles of genius and our authors now see their works printed even at foreign presses while we are furnishing with our gratuitous labours nearly the whole literature of a new empire yet so late as in the reign of anne our poets were only known by the latin versifiers of the musee anglicane and when boileau was told of the public funeral of dryden he was pleased with the national honours bestowed on genius but he declared that he never heard of his name before this great legislator of parnassus has never alluded to one of our own poets so insular then was our literary glory the most remarkable fact or perhaps assertion i have met with of the little knowledge which the continent had of our writers is a french translation of bishop hall's characters of virtues and vices it is a duodecimo printed at paris of one hundred and nine pages sixteen ten with this title caractere de vertu et de vice tire de l'anglois de m joseph hall in a dedication to the earl of salisbury the translator informs his lordship that ce livre est la première traduction de l'anglois jamais imprimé en aucun vulgaire the first translation from the english ever printed in any modern language whether the translator is a bold liar or an ignorant blunderer remains to be ascertained at all events it is a humiliating demonstration of the small progress which our home literature had made abroad in sixteen ten i come now to notice a contemporary writer professedly writing the history of our poetry of which his knowledge will open to us as we proceed with our enlightened and amateur historian father quadrios della storia el del ragione d'ogni poesia is a gigantic work which could only have been projected and persevered in by some hypochondriac monk who to get rid of the ennui of life could discover no pleasanter way than to bury himself alive in seven monstrous closely printed quartos and every day be compiling something on a subject which he did not understand fortunately for father quadrio without taste to feel and discernment to decide nothing occurred in this progress of literary history and criticism to abridge his volumes and his amusements and with diligence and erudition unparalleled he has here built up a receptacle for his immense curious and trifling knowledge on the poetry of every nation quadrio is among that class of authors whom we receive with more gratitude than pleasure fly to sometimes to quote but never linger to read and fix on our shelves but seldom have in our hands i have been much mortified in looking over this voluminous compiler to discover although he wrote so late as about seventeen fifty how little the history of english poetry was known to foreigners it is assuredly our own fault we have too long neglected the bibliography and the literary history of our own country italy spain and france have enjoyed eminent bibliographers we have none to rival them italy may justly glory in her tiraboschi and her mazzuchelli 
spain in the bibliothecas of nicholas antonio and france so rich in bibliographical treasures affords models to every literary nation of every species of literary history with us the partial labour of the hermit antony for the oxford writers compiled before philosophical criticism existed in the nation and wharton's history of poetry which was left unfinished at its most critical period when that delightful antiquary of taste had just touched the threshold of his paradise these are the sole great labours to which foreigners might resort but these will not be found of much use to them the neglect of our own literary history has therefore occasioned the errors sometimes very ridiculous ones of foreign writers respecting our authors even the lively chardon in his dictionnaire historique gives the most extraordinary accounts of most of the english writers without an english guide to attend such weary travellers they have too often been deceived by the mirages of our literature they have given blundering accounts of works which do exist and chronicled others which never did exist and have often made up the personal history of our authors by confounding two or three into one chardon mentioning dryden's tragedies observes that atterbury translated two into latin verse entitled achitophel and absalom footnote even recently il cavaliere onofrio boni in his eloge of lanzi in naming the three augustan periods of modern literature fixes them for the italians under leo the tenth for the french under louis the fourteenth or the great and for the english under charles the second end of footnote of all these foreign authors none has more egregiously failed than this good father quadrio in this universal history of poetry i was curious to observe what sort of figure we made and whether the fertile genius of our original poets had struck the foreign critic with admiration or with critical censure but little was our english poetry known to its universal historian in the chapter on those who have cultivated la melica poesia in propria lingua tra tedeschi fiamingi e inglesi we find the following list of english poets of john gower whose rhymes and verses are preserved in manuscript in the college of the most holy trinity in cambridge arthur kelton flourished in fifteen forty eight a skilful english poet he composed various poems in english also he lauds the cambrians and their genealogy the works of william wycherley in english prose and verse these were the only english poets whom quadrio at first could muster together in his subsequent editions he caught the name of sir philip sidney with an adventurous criticism le sou poesie assez buone he then was lucky enough to pick up the title not the volume surely which was one of the rarest fiori por etesi de e cauli which he calls poesie amorose this must mean that early volume of cauli's published in his thirteenth year under the title of poetical blossoms further he laid hold of john dunn by the skirt and thomas creech at whom he made a full pause informing his italians that his poems are reputed by his nation as assai buone he has also le opere di guglielmo but to this christian name as it would appear he had not ventured to add the surname at length in his progress of inquiry in his fourth volume for they were published at different periods he suddenly discovers a host of english poets in waller duke of buckingham lord roscommon and others among whom is dr swift but he acknowledges their works have not reached him shakespeare at length appears on the scene but quadrio's notions are derived from voltaire whom perhaps he boldly translates instead of improving our drama he conducted it a totale rovina nella sue forse monstruose che si chiaman tragedie alcune scene vi abbia 
luminose e bella e al suni trati si trovono terribili e grandi otway is said to have composed a tragic drama on the subject of venezia salvata he adds with surprise ma affata regolare regularity is the essence of genius with such critics as quadrio dryden is also mentioned but the only drama specified is king arthur addison is the first englishman who produced a classical tragedy but though quadrio writes much about the life of addison he never alludes to the spectator we come now to a more curious point whether quadrio had read our comedies may be doubtful but he distinguishes them by very high commendation our comedy he says represents human life the manners of citizens and the people much better than the french and spanish comedies in which all the business of life is mixed up with love affairs the spaniards had their gallantry from the moors and their manners from chivalry to which they added their tumid african taste differing from that of other nations i shall translate what he now adds of english comedy the english more skilfully even than the french have approximated to the true idea of comic subjects choosing for the argument of their invention the customary and natural objects of the citizens and the populace and when religion and decorum were more respected in their theatres they were more advanced in this species of poetry and merited not a little praise above their neighbouring nations but more than the english and the french to speak according to pure and bare truth have the italians signalized themselves a sly insinuating criticism but as on the whole for reasons which i cannot account for father quadrio seems to have relished our english comedy we must value his candour he praises our comedy per il bello ed il buono but as he is a methodical aristotelian he will not allow us that liberty in the theatre which we are supposed to possess in parliament by delivering whatever we conceive to the purpose his criticism is a specimen of the irrefragable we must not abandon legitimate rules to give mere pleasure thereby because pleasure is produced by and flows from the beautiful and the beautiful is chiefly drawn from the good order and unity in which it consists quadrio succeeded in discovering the name of one of our greatest comic geniuses for alluding to our diversity of action in comedy he mentions in his fifth column page one hundred and forty eight il celebre benjansen nella sua commedia initolato bartolomeo for i ceri e in quella altro commedia intitolato ipsum vitz the reader may decipher the poet's name with his fare but it required the critical sagacity of mr deuce to discover that by ipsum beats we are to understand shadwell's comedy of epson wells the italian critic had transcribed what he and his italian printer could not spell we have further discovered the source of his intelligence in st avramont who had classed shadwell's comedy with ben jonson's to such shifts is the writer of an universal history d'ogni poesia miserably reduced towards the close of the fifth volume we at last find the sacred muse of milton but unluckily he was a man di pochissima religione and spoke of christ like an arian quadrio quotes ramsay for milton's vomiting forth abuse on the roman church his figures are said to be often mean unworthy of the majesty of his subject but in a later place accepting his religion our poet it is decided on is worthy di molti laudi thus much for the information the curious may obtain on english poetry from its universal history quadrio unquestionably writes with more ignorance than prejudice against us he has not only highly distinguished the comic genius of our writers and raised it above that of our neighbours but he has also advanced another discovery which ranks us still higher for original invention and which i am confident will be as new as it is extraordinary to the english reader 
quadrio who among other erudite accessories to his work has exhausted the most copious researches on the origin of punch and harlequin has also written with equal curiosity and value the history of puppet shows but whom has he lauded whom has he placed paramount above all other people for their genius of invention in improving this art the english and the glory which has hitherto been universally conceded to the italian nation themselves appears to belong to us for we it appears while others were dandling and pulling their little representatives of human nature into such awkward and unnatural motions first invented pulleys or wires and gave a fine and natural action to the artificial life of these gesticulating machines we seem to know little of ourselves as connected with the history of puppet shows but in an article in the curious dictionary of trevoux i find that jean briochet to whom had been attributed the invention of marionettes is only to be considered as an improver in his time but the learned writers supply no date an englishman discovered the secret of moving them by springs and without strings but the marionettes of briochet were preferred for the pleasantries which he made them deliver the erudite quadrio appears to have more successfully substantiated our claims to the pulleys or wires or springs of the puppets than any of our own antiquaries and perhaps the uncommemorated name of this englishman was that powell whose solomon and sheba were celebrated in the days of addison and steele the former of whom has composed a classical and sportive latin poem on this very subject but quadrio might well rest satisfied that the nation which could boast of its fantacini surpassed and must ever surpass the puny efforts of a dull loving people End of section twenty nine section thirty of curiosities of literature volume three this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org recording by greg giordano curiosities of literature volume three by isaac desraeli political religionism in professor dugald stewart's first dissertation on the progress of philosophy i find this singular and significant term it has occasioned me to reflect on those contests for religion in which a particular faith has been made the ostensible pretext while the secret motive was usually political the historians who view in religious wars only religion itself have written large volumes in which we may never discover that they have either been a struggle to obtain predominance or an expedient to secure it the hatreds of ambitious men have disguised their own purposes while christianity has borne the odium of loosening a destroying spirit among mankind which had christianity never existed would have equally prevailed in human affairs of a moral malady it is not only necessary to know the nature but to designate it by a right name that we may not err in our mode of treatment if we call that religious which we shall find for the greater part is political we are likely to be mistaken in the regimen and the cure fox in his acts and monuments writes the martyrology of the protestants in three mighty folios where in the third the tender mercies of the catholics are cut in wood for those who might not otherwise be enabled to read or spell them such pictures are abridgments of long narratives but they leave in the mind a fullness of horror fox made more than one generation shudder and his volume particularly this third chained to a reading desk in the halls of the great and in the aisles of churches often detained the loiterer 
as it furnished some new scene of papistical horrors to paint forth on returning to his fireside the protestants were then the martyrs because under mary the protestants had been thrown out of power dodd has opposed to fox three curious folios which he calls the church history of england exhibiting a most abundant martyrology of the catholics inflicted by the hands of the protestants who in the succeeding reign of elizabeth after long trepidations and balancings were confirmed into power he grieves over the delusion and seduction of the black-letter romance of honest john fox which he says quote, has obtained a place in protestant churches next to the bible while john fox himself is esteemed little less than an evangelist End quote. footnote fox's martyrs as this book was popularly called was often chained to a reading desk in churches one is still thus affixed it sir ancestor it thus received equal honor with the bible End of footnote. dodd's narratives are not less pathetic for the situation of the catholic who had to secrete himself as well as to suffer was more adapted for romantic adventures than even the melancholy but monotonous story of the protestants tortured in the cell or bound to the stake these catholics however were attempting all sorts of intrigues and the saints and martyrs of dodd to the parliament of england were only traitors and conspirators highland in his history of the puritans and the presbyterians blackens them for political devils he is a spagnolet of history blinding himself with horrors at which the painter himself must have started he tells of their oppositions to monarchical and episcopal government their motivations in the church and their embroilments of the kingdoms the sword rages in their hands treason sacrilege plunder while quote, more of the blood of englishmen had poured like water within the space of four years than had been shed in the civil wars of york and lancaster in four centuries End quote. neil opposes a more elaborate history where these great and good men the puritans and the presbyterians quote, are placed among the reformers end quote, while their fame is blanched into angelic purity neil and his party opined that the protestant had not sufficiently protested and that the reformation itself needed to be reformed they wearied the impatient elizabeth and her ardent churchmen and disputed with the learned james and his courtly bishops about such ceremonial trifles that the historian may blush or smile who has to record them when the puritan was thrown out of preferment and seated into separation he turned into a presbyter nonconformity was their darling sin and their sullen triumph calumny in four painful volumes chronicles the bloodless martyrology of the two thousand silenced and ejected ministers their history is not glorious and their heroes are obscure but it is a domestic tale when the second charles was restored the presbyterians like every other faction were to be amused if not courted some of the king's chaplains were selected from among them and preached once their hopes were raised that they should by some agreement be enabled to share in that ecclesiastical establishment which they had so often opposed and the bishops met the presbyters in a convocation at the savoy a conference was held between the high church resuming the seat of power and the low church now prostrate that is between the old clergy who had recently been mercilessly ejected by the new who in their turn were awaiting their fate the conference was closed with arguments by the weaker and votes by the stronger many curious anecdotes of this conference have come down to us the presbyterians in their last struggle petitioned for indulgence but oppressors who had become petitioners only showed that they possessed no longer the means of resistance this conference was followed up by the act of uniformity which took place on bartholomew day august twenty fourth sixteen fifty two 
an act which ejected Columet's two thousand ministers from the bosom of the established church. Bartholomew Day, with this party, was long paralleled, and perhaps is still, with the dreadful French massacre of that fatal saint's day. The calamity was rather, however, of a private than of a public nature. The two thousand ejected ministers were indeed deprived of their livings. But this was, however, a happier fate than what has often occurred in these contests for the security of political power. This ejection was not like the expulsion of the Moriscos, the best and most useful subjects of Spain, which was a human sacrifice of half a million of men, and the proscription of many Jews from that land of Catholicism, or the massacre of thousands of Huguenots, and the expulsion of more than a hundred thousand by Louis the Fourteenth from France. The Presbyterian divines were not driven from their fatherland, and compelled to learn another language than their mother tongue. Destitute as divines, they were suffered to remain as citizens, and the result was remarkable. These divines could not disrobe themselves of their learning and their piety, while several of them were compelled to become tradesmen, among these the learned Samuel Chandler, whose literary productions are numerous, kept a bookseller's shop in the poultry. Hard as this event proved in its result, it was, however, pleaded that, quote, it was but like for like, end quote, and that the history of the like might not be curtailed in the telling, opposed to Calamy's chronicle of the two thousand ejected ministers, stands another, in folio magnitude of the same sort of chronicle of the clergy of the church of england with a title by no means less pathetic this is walker's quote, attempt towards recovering an account of the clergy of the church of england who were sequestered harassed etc in the late times end quote. walker is himself astonished at the size of his volume the number of his sufferers and the variety of the sufferings. Quote, Shall the church, says he, not have the liberty to preserve the history of her sufferings, as well as the separation to set forth an account of theirs? Can Dr. Calamy be acquitted for publishing the history of the Bartholomew sufferers, if I am condemned for writing that of the sequestered loyalists? End quote. He allows that quote, the number of the ejected amounts to two thousand. End quote. and there were no less than quote, seven or eight thousand of the episcopal clergy imprisoned banished and sent a starving etc etc whether the reformed were martyred by the catholics or the catholics executed by the reformed whether the puritans expelled those of the established church or the established church ejected the puritans all seems reducible to two classes conformists and nonconformists or in the political style the administration and the opposition when we discover that the heads of all parties are of the same hot temperament and observe the same evil conduct in similar situations when we view honest old latimer with his own hands hanging a mendicant friar on a tree and the government changing the friars binding latimer to the stake when we see the french catholics cutting out the tongues of the protestants that they might no longer protest the haughty luther writing submissive apologies to leo x and henry the eighth for the scurrility with which he had treated them in his writings and finding that his apologies were received with contempt then retracing his retractions when we find that haughtiest of the haughty john knox when elizabeth first ascended the throne crouching and repenting of having written his famous excommunication against all female sovereignty or pulling down the monasteries from the axiom that when the rookery was destroyed the rooks would never return we find his recent apologist admiring while he apologizes for some extraordinary proofs of machiavellian politics an impenetrable mystery seems to hang over the conduct of men who professed to be guided by the bloodless code of jesus but try them by a human standard and treat them as politicians and the motives once discovered the actions are understood two edicts of charles v 
in 1555, condemned to death the reformed of the Low Countries, even should they return to the Catholic faith, with this exception, however, in favor of the latter, that they shall not be burnt alive, but that the men shall be beheaded, and the women buried alive. Religion could not then be the real motive of the Spanish cabinet, for in returning to the ancient faith that point was obtained, but the truth is that the Spanish government considered the reformed as rebels, whom it was not safe to readmit to the rights of citizenship. The undisguised fact appears in the codicil to the will of the emperor, when he solemnly declares that he had written to the Inquisition, quote, to burn and extirpate the heretics, end quote, after trying to make Christians of them, because he is convinced that they never can become sincere Catholics. And he acknowledges that he had committed a great fault in permitting Luther to return free on the faith of his safe conduct, as the emperor was not bound to keep a promise with a heretic. Quote, it is because that I destroyed him not that heresy is now become strong, which I am convinced might have been stifled with him in its birth. End quote. Footnote Laurentes Critical History of the Inquisition. End of footnote. The whole conduct of Charles V in this mighty revolution was, from its beginning, censured by contemporaries as purely political. Francis I observed that the emperor, under the color of religion, was placing himself at the head of a league to make his way to a predominant monarchy. Quote, the pretext of religion is no new thing, writes the Duke of Nevers. Charles V had never undertaken a war against the Protestant princes, but with the design of rendering the imperial crown hereditary to the House of Austria, and he has only attacked the electoral princes to ruin them, and to abolish the right of election. Had it been zeal for the Catholic religion, would he have delayed from 1519 to 1549 to arm, that he might have extinguished the Lutheran heresy, which he could easily have done in 1526, but he considered that this novelty would serve to divide the German princes, and he patiently waited till the effect was realized. Footnote. Node. Considerations Politique. Page 115. See a curious note in Hart's Life of Gustavus Adolphus. 129. End of footnote. Good men of both parties, mistaking the nature of these religious wars, have drawn horrid inferences. The dragonades of Louis the Fourteenth excited the admiration of Broyer and Anquetil in his Esprit de la Ligue compares the revocation of the Edict of Nantes to a salutary amputation. The massacre of St. Bartholomew in its own day, and even recently has found advocates. A Greek professor at the time asserted that there were two classes of Protestants in France, political and religious, and that, quote, the late ebullition of public vengeance was solely directed against the former, end quote. Dr. McCree, cursing the Catholic with a Catholic's curse, execrates, quote, the stale sophistry of this calumniator, end quote. But should we allow that the Greek professor who advocated their national crime was the wretch the Calvinistic doctor describes, yet the nature of things cannot be altered to the equal violence of Peter Charpentier and Dr. McCrae. This subject of political religionism is indeed as nice as it is curious. Politics have been so cunningly worked into the cause of religion that the parties themselves will never be able to separate them, and to this moment the most opposite opinions are formed concerning the same events and the same persons. When public disturbances broke out at Nismi on the first restoration of the Bourbons, the Protestants, who there are numerous, declared that they were persecuted for religion, and their cry, echoed by their brethren the dissenters, resounded in this country. We have not forgotten the ferment it raised here. Much was said, and something was done. 
our minister however persisted in declaring that it was a mere political affair it is clear that our government was right on the cause and those zealous complainants wrong who only observed the effect for as soon as the bourbonists had triumphed over the bonapartists we heard no more of those sanguinary persecutions of the protestant of nismi of which a dissenter has just published a large history it is a curious fact that when two writers at the same time were occupied in a life of cardinal zeminis fleischer converted the cardinal into a saint and every incident in his administration was made to connect itself with his religious character marsollier a writer very inferior to fleischer shows the cardinal merely as a politician the elegances of fleischer were soon neglected by the public and the deep interest of truth soon acquired and still retain for the less elegant writer the attention of the statesman a modern historian has observed that quote, the affairs of religion were the grand fomenters and promoters of the thirty years war which first brought down the powers of the north to mix in the politics of the southern states End quote. the fact is indisputable but the cause is not so apparent gustavus adolphus the vast military genius of his age had designed and was successfully attempting to oppose the overgrown power of the imperial house of austria which had long aimed at a universal monarchy in europe a circumstance which philip the fourth weakly hinted at to the world when he placed this motto under his arms quote, sine ipso factum est nihil End quote an expression applied to jesus christ by st john end of section thirty recording by greg giordano newport ritchie florida section thirty one curiosities of literature volume three this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Annie Hill. Curiosities of Literature, Volume Three, by Isaac Disraeli. Toleration, an enlightened toleration, is a blessing of the last age. It would seem to have been practiced by the Romans when they did not mistake the primitive Christians for seditious members of society, and was inculcated even by Mahomet in a passage in the koran but scarcely practised by his followers in modern history it was condemned when religion was turned into a political contest under the aspiring house of austria and in spain and in france it required a long time before its nature was comprehended and to this moment it is far from being clear either to the tolerators or the tolerated it does not appear that the precepts or the practice of jesus and the apostles inculcate the compelling of any to be christians footnote one six one bishop barlow's several miscellaneous and weighty cases of conscience resolved sixteen ninety two his case of a toleration in matters of religion addressed to robert boyle page thirty nine this volume was not intended to have been given to the world a circumstance which does not make it the less curious end of footnote yet an expression employed in the nuptial parable of the great supper when the hospitable lord commanded the servant finding that he had still room to accommodate more guests to go out into the highways and hedges and compel them to come in that my house may be filled was alleged as an authority by those catholics who called themselves the converters for using religious force which still alluding to the hospitable lord they called a charitable and salutary violence it was this circumstance which produced bale's commentaire philosophique sur ces paroles de jesus christ published under the supposititious name of an englishman as printed at canterbury in sixteen eighty six but really at amsterdam it is curious that locke published his first letter on toleration in latin at gouda in sixteen eighty nine the second in 1690, and the third in 1692. Bale opened the mind of Locke 
and some time after quotes locke's latin letter with high commendation the caution of both writers in publishing in foreign places however indicates the prudence which it was deemed necessary to observe in writing in favour of toleration these were the first philosophical attempts but the earliest advocates for toleration may be found among the religious controversialists of a preceding period it was probably started among the fugitive sects who had found an asylum in holland it was a blessing which they had gone far to find and the miserable reduced to humane feelings are compassionate to one another with us the sect called the independents had early in our revolution under charles i pleaded for the doctrine of religious liberty and long maintained it against the presbyterians both proved persecutors when they possessed power the first of our respectable divines who advocated this cause were jeremy taylor in his discourse on the liberty of prophesying sixteen forty seven and bishop hall who had pleaded the cause of moderation in a discourse about the same period footnote one six three recent writers among our sectarists assert that dr owen was the first who wrote in favour of toleration in sixteen forty eight another claims the honour for john goodwin the chaplain of oliver cromwell who published one of his obscure polemical tracts in sixteen forty four among a number of other persons who at that crisis who did not venture to prefix their names to please in favour of toleration so delicate and so obscure did this subject then appear in sixteen fifty one they translated the liberal treatise of grotius de imperio sumerum potestantum circa sacra under the title of the authority of the highest powers about sacred things london eight volume sixteen fifty one to the honour of grotius the first philosophical reformers be it recorded that he displeased both parties End of footnote. locke had no doubt examined all these writers the history of opinions is among the most curious of history and i suspect that bale was well acquainted with the pamphlets of our sectarists who in their flight to holland conveyed those curiosities of theology which had cost them their happiness and their estates i think he indicates this hidden source of his ideas by the extraordinary ascription of his book to an englishman and fixing the place of its publication at canterbury toleration has been a vast engine in the hands of modern politicians it was established in the united provinces of holland and our numerous nonconformists took refuge in that asylum for disturbed consciences it attracted a valuable community of french refugees it conducted a colony of hebrew fugitives from portugal conventicles of brownists quakers meetings french churches and jewish synagogues and had it been required mahometan mosques in amsterdam were the precursors of its march and its exchange the moment they could preserve their consciences sacred to themselves they lived without mutual persecution and mixed together as good dutchmen the excommunicated part of europe seemed to be the most enlightened and it was then considered as a proof of the admirable progress of the human mind that locke and clark and newton corresponded with leibnitz and others of the learned in france and italy some were astonished that philosophers who differed in their religious opinions should communicate among themselves with so much toleration it is not however clear that had any one of these sects at amsterdam obtained predominance which was sometimes attempted they would have granted to others the toleration they participated in common the infancy of a party is accompanied by a political weakness which disables it from weakening others the catholic in this country pleads for toleration in his own he refuses to grant it here the presbyterian who had complained of persecution once fixed in the seat of power abrogated every kind of independence among others when the flames consumed servetus at geneva the controversy began whether the civil magistrate might punish heretics which beza the associate of calvin maintained he triumphed in the small 
predestinating city of geneva but the book he wrote was fatal to the protestants a few leagues distant among a majority of catholics whenever the protestants complained of the persecutions they suffered the catholics for authority and sanction never failed to appeal to the volume of their own beza m necker de Saussure has recently observed on what trivial circumstances the change or the preservation of the established religion in different districts of europe has depended when the reformation penetrated into switzerland the government of the principality of Neufchatel, wishing to allow liberty of conscience to all their subjects invited each parish to vote for or against the adoption of the new worship and in all the parishes except two the majority of suffrages declared in favour of the protestant communion the inhabitants of the small village of cressier had also assembled and forming an even number there happened to be an equality of votes for and against the change of religion a shepherd being absent tending the flocks on the hills they summoned him to appear and decide this important question when having no liking to innovation he gave his voice in favour of the existing form of worship and this parish remained catholic and is so at this day in the heart of protestant cantons i proceed to some facts which i have arranged for the history of toleration in the memoirs of james the second when that monarch published the declaration for liberty of conscience the catholic reasons and liberalizes like a modern philosopher he accuses the jealousy of our clergy who had degraded themselves to intriguers and like mechanics in a trade who are afraid of nothing so much as interlopers they had therefore induced indifferent persons to imagine that their earnest contest was not about their faith but about their temporal possessions it was incongruous that a church which does not pretend to be infallible should constrain persons under heavy penalties and punishments to believe as she does they delighted he asserted to hold an iron rod over dissenters and catholics so sweet was dominion that the very thought of others participating in their freedom made them deny the very doctrine they preached the chief argument the catholic urged on this occasion was the reasonableness of repealing laws which made men liable to the greatest punishment for that it was not in their power to remedy for that no man could force himself to believe what he really did not believe such was the rational language of the most bigoted of zealots the fox can bleat like a lamb at the very moment james the second was uttering this mild expostulation in his own heart he had anathematized the nation for i have seen some of the king's private papers which still exist they consist of communications chiefly by the most bigoted priests with the wildest projects and the most infatuated prophecies and dreams of restoring the true catholic faith in england had the jesuit-led monarch retained the english throne the language he now addressed to the nation would have been no longer used and in that case it would have served his protestant subjects he asked for toleration to become intolerant he devoted himself not to the hundredth part of the english nation and yet he was surprised that he was left one morning without an army when the catholic monarch issued this declaration for liberty of conscience the jekyll of his day observed that it was but scaffolding they intend to build another house and when that house popery is built they will take down the scaffold when presbytery was our lord they who had endured the tortures of persecution and raised such sharp outcries for freedom of all men were the most intolerant hardly had they tasted of the circean cup of dominion ere they were transformed into the most hideous or the most grotesque monsters of political power to their eyes toleration was an hydra and the dethroned bishops had never so vehemently declaimed against what in ludicrous rage one of the high-flying presbyterians called a cursed intolerable toleration they advocated the rights of persecution and shallow edwards as milton calls the author of the gangrenia 
published a treatise against toleration they who had so long complained of the licensers now sent all the books they condemned to penal fires prine now vindicated the very doctrines under which he himself has so severely suffered assuming the highest possible power of civil government even to the infliction of death on its opponents prine lost all feeling for the ears of others the idea of toleration was not intelligible for too long a period in the annals of europe no parties probably could conceive the idea of toleration in the struggle for predominance treaties are not preferred when conquest is the concealed object men were immolated a massacre was a sacrifice medals were struck to commemorate these holy persecutions footnote one six seven it is curious to observe that the catholics were afterward ashamed of these indiscretions they were unwilling to own that there were any medals which commemorate massacres thaunus in his fifty-third book has minutely described them the medals however have become excessively scarce but copies inferior to the originals have been sold they had also pictures on similar subjects accompanied by insulting inscriptions which latter they have effaced sometimes very imperfectly see hollis's memoirs page three twelve to fourteen this enthusiast advertised in the papers to request travellers to procure them End of footnote. the destroying angel holding in one hand a cross and in the other a sword with these words Vognatorum Stratige, 1572, the massacre of the Huguenots, proves that toleration will not agree with that date. Footnote 168. The Salal Regia of the Vatican has still upon its walls a painting by Vasari of this massacre, among the other important events in the history of the popes similarly commemorated. End of footnote. Castelnau a statesman and a humane man was at a loss how to decide on a point of the utmost importance to france in fifteen thirty two they first began to burn the lutherans or calvinists and to cut out the tongues of all protestants that they might no longer protest according to father paul fifty thousand persons had perished in the netherlands by different tortures for religion but a change in the religion of the state Castelnau considered what occasion one in the government he wondered how it happened that the more they punished with death it only increased the number of the victims martyrs produce proselytes as a statesman he looked round the great field of human actions in the history of the past there he discovered that the romans were more enlightened in their actions than ourselves that trajan commanded pliny the younger not to molest the christians for their religion but should their conduct endanger the state to put down illegal assemblies that julian the apostate expressly forbade the execution of the christians who then imagined that they were securing their salvation by martyrdom but he ordered all their goods to be confiscated a severe punishment by which julian prevented more than he could have done by persecutions all this he adds we read in ecclesiastical history such were the sentiments of castelnau in 1560 amidst perplexities of state necessity and of our common humanity the notion of toleration had not entered into the views of the statesman it was also at this time that de Sanctes, a great controversial writer declared that had the fires lighted for the destruction of calvinism not been extinguished the sect had not spread about half a century subsequent to this period thaunus was perhaps the first great mind who appears to have insinuated to the french monarch and his nation that they might live at peace with heretics by which avowal he called down on himself the haughty indignation of rome and a declaration that the man who spoke in favour of heretics must necessarily be one of the first class here the afflicted historian have men no compassion after forty years passed full of continual miseries 
have they no fear after the loss of the netherlands occasioned by the frantic obstinacy which marked the times i grieve that such sentiment should have occasioned my book to have been examined with a rigueur that amounts to calumny such was the language of thaunus in a letter written in sixteen o six which indicates an approximation to toleration but which term was not probably yet found in any dictionary we may consider as so many attempts at toleration the great national synod of dort whose history is amply written by brandt and the mitigating protestantism of laud to approximate to the ceremonies of the roman church but the synod after holding about two hundred sessions closed dividing men into universalists and semi-universalists supralapsarians and sublapsarians the reform themselves produced the remonstrance and loud ceremonies ended in placing the altar eastward and in raising the scaffold for the monarchy and the hierarchy error is circuitous when it will do what it has not yet learnt they were pressing for conformity to do that which a century afterward they found could only be done by toleration the secret history of toleration among certain parties has been disclosed to us by a curious document from that religious machiavelli the fierce ascetic republican john knox a calvinist pope while the posterity of abraham says that mighty and artful reformer were few in number and while they sojourned in different countries they were merely required to avoid all participation in the idolatrous rites of the heathen but as soon as they prospered into a kingdom and had obtained possession of canaan they were strictly charged to suppress idolatry and to destroy all monuments and incentives the same duty was now incumbent on the professors of the true religion in scotland formerly when not more than ten persons in a county were enlightened it would have been foolishness to have demanded of the nobility the suppression of idolatry but now when knowledge had been increased and see such are the men who cry out for toleration during their state of political weakness but who cancel the bond by which they hold their tenure whenever they obtain possession of canaan the only commentary on this piece of the secret history of toleration is the acute remark of swift we are fully convinced that we shall always tolerate them but not that they will tolerate us the truth is that toleration was allowed by none of the parties and i will now show the dilemmas into which each party thrust itself when the kings of england would forcibly have established episcopacy in scotland the presbyters passed an act against the toleration of dissenters from presbyterian doctrines and discipline and thus as guthrie observes they were committing the same violence on the consciences of their brethren which they opposed in the king the presbyterians contrived their famous covenant to dispossess the royalists of their livings and the independents who assumed the principle of toleration in their very name shortly after enforced what they called the engagement to eject the presbyterians in england where the dissenters were ejected their great advocate calamy complains that the dissenters were only making use of the same arguments which most eminent reformers had done in their noble defence of the reformation against the papists while the arguments of the established church against the dissenters were the same which were urged by the papists against the protestant reformation footnote one seven two i quote from an unpublished letter written so late as in seventeen forty nine addressed to the author of the free and candid disquisition by the rev thomas allen rector of kettering northamptonshire however extravagant his doctrine appears to us i suspect that it exhibits the concealed sentiments of even some protestant churchmen this rector of kettering attributes the growth of schism to the negligence of the clergy and seems to have persecuted both the archbishops to his detriment as he tells us with singular plans of reform borrowed from monastic institutions 
he wished to revive the practice inculcated by a canon of the council of Lodicea, of having prayers ad horum nonum et ad vesperum prayers twice a day in the churches but his grand project take in his own words i let the archbishop know that i had composed an irenicon wherein i proved the necessity of an ecclesiastical power over consciences in matters of religion which utterly silences their arguments who plead so hard for toleration i took my scheme from a discourse of ecclesiastical polity wherein the authority of the civil magistrate over the consciences of subjects in matters of external religion is asserted the mischiefs and inconveniences of toleration are represented and all pretences pleaded in behalf of liberty of conscience are fully answered if this book were reprinted and considered the king would know his power and the people their duty the rector of kettering seems not to have known that the author of this discourse on ecclesiastical polity was the notorious parker immortalized by the satire of marvel this political apostate from a republican and presbyterian became a furious advocate for arbitrary government in church and state he easily won the favour of james the second who made him bishop of oxford his principles were so violent that father petrie the confessor of james made sure of him this letter of the rector of kettering in adopting the system of such a catholic bishop confirms my suspicion that toleration is condemned as an evil among some protestants End of footnote. when the presbyterians were our masters and preached up the doctrine of passive obedience in spiritual matters to the civil power it was unquestionably passing a self-condemnation on their own recent opposition and detraction of the former episcopacy whenever men act from a secret motive entirely contrary to their ostensible one such monstrous results will happen and as extremes will join however opposite they appear in their beginnings john knox and father petrie in office would have equally served james the second as confessor and prime minister a fact relating to the famous justice lipsius proves the difficulty of forming a clear notion of toleration this learned man after having been ruined by the religious wars of the netherlands found an honourable retreat in a professor's chair at leyden and without difficulty abjured papacy he published some political works and adopted as his great principle that only one religion should be allowed to a people that no clemency should be granted to nonconformists who he declares should be pursued by sword and fire in this manner a single member would be cut off to preserve the body sound ur seca are his words strange notions these in a protestant republic and in fact in holland it was approving of all the horrors of their oppressors the duke d'alva and philip the second from which they had hardly recovered footnote one seven three the cruelties practised by the protestant against the catholic party are pictured and described in arnaud van gelub's book over de ontlenge van drive verscheden nieuw gerformide martelers beken published at antwerp in sixteen fifty six end of footnote it was a principle by which we must inevitably infer says bale that in holland no other mode of religious belief but one sect should be permitted and that those pagans who had hanged the missionaries of the gospel had done what they ought lipsius found himself sadly embarrassed when refuted by theodore cornhurt footnote one seven four cornhurt was one of the fathers of dutch literature and even of their arts he was the composer of the great national air of william of orange he was too a famous engraver the master of goltzius on his deathbed he was still writing against the persecution of heretics End of footnote. the firm advocate of political and religious freedom and at length lipsius that protestant with a catholic heart was forced to eat his words like pistol his onion declaring that the two objectional words ur seca 
were borrowed from medicine meaning not literally fire and sword but a strong efficacious remedy one of those powerful medicines to expel poison jean de serres a warm huguenot carried the principle of toleration so far in his inventaire general de l'histoire de france as to blame charles martel for compelling the friesens whom he had conquered to adopt christianity a pardonable zeal he observes in a warrior but in fact the minds of men cannot be gained over by arms nor that religion forced upon them which must be introduced into the hearts of men by reason it is curious to see a protestant in his zeal for toleration blaming a king for forcing idolaters to become christians and to have found an opportunity to express his opinions in the dark history of the eighth century is an instance how historians incorporate their passions in their work and view ancient facts with modern eyes the protestant cannot grant toleration to the catholic unless the catholic ceases to be a papist and the arminian church which opened its wide bosom to receive every denomination of christians nevertheless were forced to exclude the papists for their passive obedience to the supremacy of the roman pontiff the catholic has curiously told us on this word toleration that si mon devient fort en usage et mesure que le l'ombre de tolérant augment it was a word which seemed of recent introduction though the book is modern the protestants have disputed much how far they might tolerate or whether they should tolerate at all a difficulty triumphantly exclaims the catholic which they are not likely ever to settle while they maintain their principles of pretended reformation the consequences which naturally follow excite horror to the christian it is the weak who raise such outcries for toleration the strong find authority legitimate a religion which admits not of toleration cannot be safely tolerated if there is any chance of its obtaining a political ascendancy when priscillian and six of his followers were condemned to torture and execution for asserting that the three persons of the trinity were to be considered as three different exceptions of the same being saint ambrose and saint martin asserted the cause of offended humanity and refused to communicate with the bishops who had called out for the blood of the priscillianists but cardinal baronius the analyst of the church was greatly embarrassed to explain how men of real purity could abstain from applauding the ardent zeal of the persecution he preferred to give up the saints rather than to allow of toleration for he acknowledges that the toleration which the saints would have allowed was not exempt from sin footnote one seven six sismondi history de francais i forty one the character of the first person who introduced civil persecution into the christian church has been described by sulpicius severus see dr maclean's note in his translation of moshim's ecclesiastical history volume i four twenty eight end a footnote in the preceding article political religionism we have shown how to provide against the possible evil of the tolerated becoming the tolerators toleration has been suspected of indifference to religion itself but with sound minds it is only an indifference to the logomachies of theology things not of god but of man that have perished and that are perishing around us end of section thirty one section thirty two of curiosities of literature volume three this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org curiosities of literature volume three by isaac disraeli apology for the parisian massacre an original document now lying before me the autograph letter of charles the ninth will prove that the unparalleled massacre called by the world religious was in the french cabinet 
considered merely as political one of those revolting state expedients which a pretended instant necessity has too often inflicted on that part of a nation which like the undercurrent subterraneously works its way and runs counter to the great stream till the critical moment arrives when one or the other must cease the massacre began on st bartholomew day in august fifteen seventy two lasted in france during seven days that awful event interrupted the correspondence of our court with that of france a long silence ensued the one did not dare to tell the tale which the other could not listen to but sovereigns know how to convert a mere domestic event into a political expedient charles the ninth on the birth of a daughter sent over an ambassador extraordinary to request elizabeth to stand as sponsor by this the french monarch obtained a double purpose it served to renew his interrupted intercourse with the silent queen and alarm the french protestants by abating their hopes which long rested on the aid of the english queen the following letter dated eighth february fifteen seventy three is addressed by the king to la motte fenelon his resident ambassador at london the king in this letter minutely details a confidential intercourse with his mother catherine of medicis who perhaps may have dictated this letter to the secretary although signed by the king with his own hand footnote all the numerous letters which i have seen of charles the ninth now in the possession of mr murray are carefully signed by himself and i have also observed postscripts written with his own hand they are always countersigned by his secretary i mention this circumstance because in the dictionnaire historique it is said that charles who died young was so given up to the amusements of his age that he would not even sign his dispatches and introduced the custom of secretaries subscribing for the king this voluminous correspondence shows the falsity of this statement history is too often composed of popular tales of this stamp End of footnote such minute particulars could only have been known to herself the earl of wolchester worcester was now taking his departure having come to paris on the baptism of the princess and accompanied by walsingham our resident ambassador after taking leave of charles had the following interview with catherine de medicis an interview with the young monarch was usually concluded by a separate audience with his mother who probably was still the directress of his councils the french court now renewed their favourite project of marrying the duc d'alencon with elizabeth they had long wished to settle this turbulent spirit and the negotiation with elizabeth had been broken off in consequence of the massacre at paris they were somewhat uneasy lest he should share the fate of his brother the duke of anjou who had not long before been expedited on the same fruitless errand and elizabeth had already objected to the disparity of their ages the duke of l'alencon being only seventeen and the maiden queen six and thirty but catherine observed that alencon was only one year younger than his brother against whom this objection had not occurred to elizabeth for he had been sent back upon another pretext some difficulty which the queen had contrived about his performing mass in his own house after catherine de medicis had assured the earl of worcester of her great affection for the queen of england and her and the king's strict intention to preserve it and that they were therefore desirous of this proposed marriage taking place she took this opportunity of inquiring of the earl of worcester the cause of the queen his mistress's marked coolness toward them the narrative becomes now dramatic on this 
walsingham who kept always close by the side of the count here took on himself to answer acknowledging that the said count had indeed been charged to speak on this head and he then addressed some words in english to worcester and afterwards the count gave to my lady and mother to understand that the queen his mistress had been waiting for an answer on two articles the one concerning religion and the other for an interview my lady and mother instantly replied that she had never heard any articles mentioned on which she would not have immediately satisfied the sieur walsingham who then took up the word first observing that the count was not accustomed to business of this nature but that he himself knew for certain that the cause of this negotiation for marriage not being more advanced was really these two unsettled points that his mistress still wished that the point of religion should be cleared up for that they concluded in england that this business was designed only to amuse and never to be completed as happened in that of my brother the duke of anjou and the other point concerned the interview between my brother the duke of alencon because some letters which may have been written between the parties footnote these love letters of alencon to our elizabeth are noticed by camden who observes that the queen became wearied by receiving so many and to put an end to this trouble she consented that the young duke should come over conditionally that he should not be offended if her suitor should return home suitless End of footnote in such sort of matters could not have the same force which the sight and presence of both the persons would undoubtedly have but he added another thing which had also greatly retarded this business was what had happened lately in this kingdom and during such troubles proceeding from religion it could not have been well time to have spoken with them concerning the said marriage and that himself and those of his nation have been in great fear in this kingdom thinking that we intended to extirpate all those of the said religion on this my lady and mother answered him instantly and in order that she was certain that the queen his mistress could never like nor value a prince who had not his religion at heart and whoever would desire to have this otherwise would be depriving him of what we hold dearest in this world that he might recollect that my brother had always insisted on the freedom of religion and that it was from the difficulty of its public exercise which he always insisted on which had broken off this negotiation the duke d'alencon will be satisfied with this point is agreed on and will hasten over to the queen persuaded that she will not occasion him the pain and the shame of passing over the seas without happily terminating this affair in regard to what has occurred these latter days that he must have seen how it happened by the fault of the chiefs of those who remained here for when the late admiral was treacherously wounded at notre dame he knew the affliction it threw us into fearful that it might have occasioned great troubles in the kingdom and the diligence we used to verify judicially whence it proceeded and the verification was nearly finished when they were so forgetful as to raise a conspiracy to attempt the lives of myself my lady and mother and my brothers and endanger the whole state which was the cause that to avoid this i was compelled to my very great regret to permit what had happened in this city but as he had witnessed i gave orders to stop as soon as possible this fury of the people and place every one in repose on this the sieur walsingham replied to my lady and mother that the exercise of the said religion had been interdicted in this kingdom to which she also answered that this had not been done but for a good and holy purpose namely that the fury of the catholic people might the sooner be allayed who else had been reminded of the past calamities and would again have been let loose against those of the said religion had they continued to preach in this kingdom also should these once more fix on 
any chiefs which i will prevent as much as possible giving them clearly and pointedly to understand that what is done here is much the same as what has been done and is now practised by the queen his mistress in her kingdom for she permits the exercise but of one religion although there are many of her people who are of another and having also during her reign punished those of her subjects whom she found seditious and rebellious it is true this has been done by the laws but i indeed could not act in the same manner for finding myself in such imminent peril and the conspiracy raised against me and mine and my kingdom ready to be executed i had no time to arraign and try in open justice as much as i wished but was constrained to my very great regret to strike the blow lachez le main in what has been done in this city this letter of charles the ninth however does not here conclude my lady and mother plainly acquaints the earl of worcester and sir francis walsingham that her son had never interfered between their mistress and her subjects and in return expects the same favour although by accounts they had received from england many ships were arming to assist their rebels at rochelle my lady and mother advances another step and declares that elizabeth by treaty is bound to assist her son against his rebellious subjects and they expect at least that elizabeth will not only stop these armaments in all her ports but exemplarily punish the offenders i resume the letter and on hearing this the said walsingham changed colour and appeared somewhat astonished as my lady and mother well perceived by his face and on this he requested the count of worcester to mention the order which he knew the queen his mistress had issued to prevent these people from assisting those of la rochelle but that in england so numerous were the seamen and others who gained their livelihood by maritime affairs and who would starve without the entire freedom of the seas that it was impossible to interdict them charles the ninth encloses the copy of a letter he had received from london in part agreeing with an account the ambassador had sent to the king of an english expedition nearly ready to sail for la rochelle to assist his rebellious subjects he is still further alarmed that elizabeth foments the and assists underhand the discontented he urges the ambassador to hasten to the queen to impart these complaints in the most friendly way as he knows the ambassador can well do and as no doubt walsingham will have already prepared for her to receive charles entreats elizabeth to prove her good faith by deeds and not by words to act openly on a point which admits of no dissimulation the best proof of her friendship will be the marriage and the ambassador after opening this business to her chief ministers who the king thinks are desirous of this projected marriage is then to acquaint the queen with what has passed between her ambassadors and myself such is the first letter on english affairs which charles the ninth dispatched to his ambassador after an awful silence of six months during which time la motte fenelon was not admitted into the presence of elizabeth the apology for the massacre of st bartholomew comes from the king himself and contains several remarkable expressions which are at least divested of that style of bigotry and exultation we might have expected on the contrary this sanguinary and inconsiderate young monarch as he is represented writes in a subdued and sorrowing tone lamenting his hard necessity regretting he could not have recourse to the laws and appealing to others for his efforts to check the fury of the people which he himself had let loose catherine de medicis who had governed him from the tender age of eleven years when he ascended the throne might unquestionably have persuaded him that a conspiracy was on the point of explosion charles the ninth died young and his character is unfavourably viewed by the historians in the voluminous correspondence which i have examined could we judge by state letters of the character of him 
who subscribes them we must form a very different notion they are so prolix and so earnest that one might conceive that they were dictated by the young monarch himself End of section thirty two section thirty three of curiosities of literature volume three this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org curiosities of literature volume three by isaac disraeli prediction part one in a curious treatise on divination or the knowledge of future events cicero has preserved a complete account of the state contrivances which were practised by the roman government to instil among the people those hopes and fears by which they regulated public opinion the pagan creed now become obsolete and ridiculous has occasioned this treatise to be rarely consulted it remains however as a chapter in the history of man to these two books of cicero on divination perhaps a third might be added on political and moral prediction the principles which may even raise it into a science are self-evident they are drawn from the heart of man and they depend on the nature and connection of human events we presume we shall demonstrate the positive existence of such a faculty a faculty which lord bacon describes of making things future and and remote as present the aruspects the augur and the astrologer have vanished with their own superstitions but the moral and the political predictor proceeding on principles authorized by nature and experience has become more skilful in his observations on the phenomena of human history and it has often happened that a tolerable philosopher has not made an indifferent prophet no great political or moral revolution has occurred which has not been accompanied by its prognostic and men of a philosophic cast of mind in their retirement freed from the delusions of parties and of sects at once intelligent in the quick quid adjunct homines while they are withdrawn from their conflicting interests have rarely been confounded by the astonishment which overwhelms those who absorbed in active life are the mere creatures of sensation agitated by the shadows of truth the unsubstantial appearances of things intellectual nations are advancing in an eternal circle of events and passions which succeed each other and the last is necessarily connected with its antecedent the solitary force of some fortuitous incident only can interrupt this concatenated progress of human affairs that every great event has been accompanied by a presage or prognostic has been observed by lord bacon the shepherds of the people should understand the prognostics of state tempests hollow blasts of wind seemingly at a distance and secret swellings of the sea often precede a storm such were the prognostics discerned by the politic bishop williams in charles the first time who clearly foresaw and predicted the final success of the puritanic party in our country attentive to his own security he abandoned the government and sided with the rising opposition at the moment when such a change in public affairs was by no means apparent in this spirit of foresight our contemplative antiquary dugdale must have anticipated the scene which was approaching in sixteen forty one in the destruction of our ancient monuments 
in cathedral churches he hurried on his itinerant labours of taking draughts and transcribing inscriptions as he says to preserve them for future and better times posterity owes to the prescient spirit of dugdale the ancient monuments of england which bear the marks of the haste as well as the zeal which have perpetuated them continental writers formerly employed a fortunate expression which they wished to have an historia reformationis anti reformationem this history of the reformation would have commenced at least a century before the reformation itself a letter from cardinal julian to pope eugenius the fourth written a century before luther appeared clearly predicts the reformation and its consequences he observed that the minds of men were ripe for something tragical he felt the axe striking at the root and the tree beginning to bend and that his party instead of propping it were hastening its fall in england sir thomas more was not less prescient in his views for when his son roper was observing to him that the catholic religion under the defender of the faith was in a most flourishing state the answer of more was an evidence of political foresight truth it is son roper and yet i pray god that we may not live to see the day that we would gladly be at league and composition with heretics to let them have their churches quietly to themselves so that they would be contented to let us have ours quietly to ourselves whether our great chancellor predicted from a more intimate knowledge of the king's character or from some private circumstances which may not have been recorded for our information of which i have an obscure suspicion remains to be ascertained the minds of men of great political sagacity were unquestionably at that moment full of obscure indications of the approaching change erasmus went at canterbury before the tomb of becket observing it loaded with a vast profusion of jewels wished that those had been distributed among the poor and that the shrine had been only adorned with boughs and flowers for said he those who have heaped up all this mass of treasure will one day be plundered and fall a prey to those who are in power a prediction literally fulfilled about twenty years after it was made the unknown author of the visions of piers ploughman who wrote in the reign of edward the third footnote though it cannot be positively asserted it is generally believed that the author was robert longland a monk of malvern see introduction to wright's edition of the vision the latter part of the year thirteen sixty two is believed to be the time of its composition End of footnote. surprise the world by a famous prediction of the fall of the religious houses from the hand of a king footnote the passage is so remarkable as to be worth giving here for the immediate reference of such readers as may not have ready access to the original we modernize the spelling from mr wright's edition but there shall come a king and confess you religious and award you as the bible telleth for breaking of your rule and then shall the abbot of abington and all his issue for ever have a knock of a king and incurable the wound End of footnote. the event was realized two hundred years afterwards by our henry the eighth the protestant writers have not scrupled to declare that in this instance he was de vino numine afflatus but moral and political prediction is not inspiration the one may be wrought out by man the other descends from god the same principle which led erasmus 
to predict that those who were in power would destroy the rich shrines because no other class of men in society could mate with so mighty a body as the monks conducted the author of piers plowman to the same conclusion and since power only could accomplish that great purpose he fixed on the highest as the most likely and thus the wise prediction was so long after literally accomplished sir walter raleigh foresaw the future consequences of the separatists and the sectaries in the national church and the very scene his imagination raised in fifteen thirty has been exhibited to the letter of his description two centuries after the prediction his memorable words are time will even bring it to pass if it were not resisted that god would be turned out of churches into barns and from thence again into the fields and mountains and under hedges all order of discipline and church government left to newness of opinion and men's fancies and as many kinds of religion spring up as there are parish churches within england we are struck by the profound genius of tacitus who clearly foresaw the calamities which so long ravaged europe on the fall of the roman empire in a work written five hundred years before the event in that sublime anticipation of the future he observed when the romans shall be hunted out from those countries which they have conquered what will then happen the revolted people freed from their master oppressor will not be able to subsist without destroying their neighbours and the most cruel wars will exist among all these nations we are told that solon at athens contemplating on the port and citadel of Manichia, suddenly exclaimed how blind is man to futurity could the athenians foresee what mischief this will do their city they would even eat it with their own teeth to get rid of it a prediction verified more than two hundred years afterwards thales desired to be buried in an obscure quarter of milesia observing that that very spot would in time be the forum charlemagne in his old age observing from the window of a castle a norman descent on his coast tears started in the eyes of the aged monarch he predicted that since they dared to threaten his dominions while he was yet living what would they do when he should be no more a melancholy prediction says de foix of their subsequent incursions and of the protracted calamities of the french nation during a whole century there seems to be something in minds which take in extensive views of human nature which serves them as a kind of divination and the consciousness of this faculty has even been asserted by some cicero appeals to atticus how he had always judged of the affairs of the republic as a good diviner and that its overthrow had happened as he had foreseen fourteen years before cicero had not only predicted what happened in his own times but also what occurred long after according to the testimony of cornelius nepos the philosopher indeed affects no secret revelation nor visionary second sight he honestly tells us that this art had been acquired merely by study and the administration of public affairs while he reminds his friend of several remarkable instances of his successful predictions i do not divine human events by the arts practised by the augurs but i use other signs cicero then expresses himself with the guarded obscurity of a philosopher who could not openly ridicule the prevailing superstitions but we perfectly comprehend the nature of his signs when in the great pending event of the rival conflicts of pompey and of caesar he shows the means he used for his purpose on one side i consider the humour and genius of caesar and on the other the condition and the manner of civil wars in a word the political diviner foretold events by their dependence on general causes 
while the moral diviner by his experience of the personal character anticipated the actions of the individual others too have asserted the possession of this faculty du Ver, a famous chancellor of france imagined the faculty was intuitive with him by his own experience he had observed the results of this curious and obscure faculty and at a time when the history of the human mind was so imperfectly comprehended it is easy to account for the apparent egotism of this grave and dignified character born says he with constitutional infirmity a mind and body but ill adapted to be laborious with a most treacherous memory enjoying no gift of nature yet able at all times to exercise a sagacity so great that i do not know since i have reached manhood that anything of importance has happened to the state to the public or to myself in particular which i had not foreseen this faculty seems to be described by a remarkable expression employed by thucydides in his character of themistocles of which the following is given as a close translation by a species of sagacity peculiarly his own for which he was in no degree indebted either to early education or after study he was super eminently happy in forming a prompt judgment in matters that admitted but little time for deliberation at the same time that he far surpassed all in his deductions of the future from the past or was the best guesser of the future from the past footnote o kaya gar zunisai kai ute pomathan s alten uden out epemathon tan te parakrema di elakistis butes kratistas nomen kai ton melton ton epipistan tu genesomenu arrestas icastis thucydides book one end of footnote should this faculty of moral and political prediction be ever considered as a science we can even furnish it with a denomination for the writer of the life of sir thomas brown prefixed to his works in claiming the honour of it for that philosopher calls it the stochastic a term derived from the greek and from archery meaning to shoot at a mark this eminent genius it seems often hit the white our biographer declares that though he were no prophet yet in that faculty which comes nearest to it he excelled that is the stochastic wherein he was seldom mistaken as to future events as well public as private we are not indeed inculcating the fanciful elements of an occult art we know whence its principles may be drawn and we may observe how it was practised by the wisest among the ancients aristotle who collected all the curious knowledge of his times has preserved some remarkable opinions on the art of divination in detailing the various subterfuges practised by the pretended diviners of his day he reveals the secret principle by which one of them regulated his predictions he frankly declared that the future being always very obscure while the past was easy to know his predictions had never the future in view for he decided from the past as it appeared in human affairs which however lie concealed from the multitude such is the true principle by which a philosophical historian may become a skilful diviner human affairs make themselves they grow out of one another with slight variations and thus it is that they usually happen as they have happened the necessary dependence of effects on causes and the similarity of human interests and human passions are confirmed by comparative parallels with the past the philosophic sage of holy writ truly deduced the important principle that the thing that hath been is that which shall be 
the vital facts of history deadened by the touch of chronological antiquarianism are restored to animation when we comprehend the principles which necessarily terminate in certain results and discover the characters among mankind who are the usual actors in these scenes the heart of man beats on the same eternal springs and whether he advances or retrogrades he cannot escape out of the march of human thought hence in the most extraordinary revolutions we discover that the time and the place only have changed for even when events are not strictly parallel we detect the same conducting principles Scipio amorato one of the great italian historians in his curious discourses on tacitus intermingles ancient examples with the modern that he says all may see how the truth of things is not altered by the changes and diversities of time machiavel drew his illustrations of modern history from the ancient when the french revolution recalled our attention to a similar eventful period in our own history the neglected volumes which preserved the public and private history of our charles the first and cromwell were collected with eager curiosity often the scene existing before us even the very personages themselves opened on us in these forgotten pages but as the annals of human nature did not commence with those of charles the first we took a still more retrograde step and it was discovered in this wider range that in the various governments of greece and rome the events of those times had been only reproduced among them the same principles had terminated in the same results and the same personages had figured in the same drama this strikingly appeared in a little curious volume entitled essai sur l'histoire de la révolution françoise par une société d'auteurs latins published at paris in eighteen hundred and one this society of latin authors who have written so inimitably the history of the french revolution consist of the roman historians themselves by extracts ingeniously applied the events of that melancholy period are so appositely described indeed so minutely narrated that they will not fail to surprise those who are not accustomed to detect the perpetual parallels which we meet with in philosophical history many of these crises in history are close resemblances of each other compare the history of the league in france with that of our own civil wars we are struck by the similar occurrences performed by the same political characters who played their part on both those great theatres of human action a satirical royalist of those times has commemorated the motives the incidents and the personages in the satire manipe de la vertu de catholicens d'espagne and this famous satire manipe is a perfect hudibras in prose the writer discovers all the bitter ridicule of butler in his ludicrous and severe exhibition of the etat de paris while the artist who designed the satirical prince becomes no contemptible hogarth so much are these public events alike in their general spirit and termination that they have afforded the subject of a printed but unpublished volume entitled essai sur les revolutions footnote this work was printed in london as a first volume but remained unpublished this singularly curious production was suppressed but reprinted at paris it has suffered the most cruel mutilations i read with surprise and instruction the single copy which i was assured was the only one saved from the havoc of the entire edition the writer was the celebrated chateaubriand End of footnote. the whole work was modelled on this principle it would be possible 
says the eloquent writer to frame a table or chart in which all the given imaginable events of the history of a people would be reduced to a mathematical exactness the conception is fanciful but its foundation lies deep in truth a remarkable illustration of the secret principle divulged by aristotle and described by thucydides appears in the recent confession of a man of genius among ourselves when mr coleridge was a political writer in the morning post and courier at a period of darkness and utter confusion that writer was then conducted by a tract of light not revealed to ordinary journalists on the napoleonic empire of that despotism in masquerade he decided by the state of rome under the first caesars and of the spanish-american revolution by taking the war of the united provinces with philip the second as the groundwork of the comparison on every great occurrence he says i endeavoured to discover in past history the event that most nearly resembled it i procured the contemporary historians memorialists and pamphleteers then fairly subtracting the points of difference from those of likeness as the balance favoured the former or the latter i conjectured that the result would be the same or different in the essays on the probable final restoration of the bourbons i feel myself authorized to affirm by the effect produced on many intelligent men that were the dates wanting it might have been suspected that the essays had been written within the last twelve months End of section thirty three